This morning I'm talking about the heart. Ones who are strong in heart. I was kind of tickled this morning driving over here listening to CNN just in the middle of one of their conversations. They were quoting Martin Luther King, one of his uh, axioms, if we can say it, uh, that darkness cannot push out darkness and hatred cannot push out hatred. And that led them talking about the importance of talking about love. This is CNN. And, and I know, it, it's like, and the person was saying, we need to hear more stories and more experiences about love rather than destroying and taking people down and trying to uh, find the most viral, popular social media posts and quotes and Twitter posts and quotes about uh, degrading you know, countries and religions and people, let's turn around and start talking about loving one another and finding words of love. I thought, we're in this zone this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be talking about ones who are strong in heart, and this is part of the Agni Yoga series. Let me begin with a quote from the book Heart of the Agni Yoga series. A great sage says, Verily, anyone who wishes to recognize the heart cannot approach it only as part of an organism. First of all, one should recognize the centrifugal aspect of the heart and study outward from it, not inward toward it. And I couldn't help but thinking about our meditation this morning. And Val was saying that Christ said, send your light out. It's the same thing. Study outward from the heart, not inward toward it. He also says, the solar plexus is the antechamber of the temple of the heart. The kundalini is the laboratory of the heart. The brain and all the centers are the estates of the heart. I really love that, that particular one. The brain and all the centers are the estates of the heart. Because nothing can exist without the heart. The heart stands as the temple of humanity. See how that ties in with what CNN was proposing today? You know, we're looking at it from a little deeper level, but uh, maybe this means a shift, you know, is taking place. So what does the master mean when he says that we should recognize the centrifugal aspect of the heart and study outward from it? Centrifugal means moving outward from a center point. It means moving outward from a central point or center point. I believe he's telling us we should first try to discover the central point of the heart, which is the cosmic heart. The cosmic heart is the centrifugal aspect of the heart. The cosmic heart nourishes each atom, each cell, and each living form on all planes. See, this is, this is very valuable to us. Why? Because the nature of a human being is to encapsulate itself <clears throat> in such a way that we don't think beyond ourselves. You know, we may think about our family members but and some of our friends, but do we really think beyond the planet? 
do we think beyond um, you know our self-centeredness our sense of superiority and conceit and that all that we are today is because of what we ourselves have done you know this this is a tendency a general tendency of humanity to think that way and so we have these great beings of light and love and power that sacrifice their lives and come to this planet and walk the planet and tell us and remind us in this case about this wonderful cosmic heart. This takes us outside of ourselves. So we're going from the heart center within ourselves and now trying to find a connection. What outside of ourselves you know, is nurturing us, is inspiring us, is healing us. Is it just my personality? It is not. Even though this is what the general stream of thinking, you know, takes place with most people. So, we have these individuals called disciples, and which is not a religious phase. It is a disciple is an individual who has committed him or herself to a greater light, and they carry that light with them wherever they go. They become beacons of light. What are they doing? This is what I imagine is that we take our torch and we give it to the cosmic heart that lights this torch and then we bring it, and that's taking our light outward. We carry this torch wherever we go, and the light from the torch is the light of the cosmic heart. So the cosmic heart nourishes each atom, each cell, each living form on all planes. This nourishing action creates a path for us to travel. It's a path called the path of spirit. It's called the spiritual path. We are traveling then to the center of the cosmic heart, from within going outward. The heart transmits from its center love and beauty and power and goodness and truth. These transmissions nourish our heart with the pearl, this the pearl of the cosmic heart. Isn't that beautiful? Love, beauty, power, goodness, and truth. Do we carry this with us? Because these transmissions nourish our heart, their heart, the heart of humanity with the pearl of the cosmic heart. And by the way, the cosmic heart is, has a specific location in space. It's not just fantasy or science fiction or something random. It has a specific place. See if you can find it. The cosmic heart and the pearl in our heart interrelate by way of what? Magnetic attraction. This magnetic attraction, there's an exchanging of harmonious energies and vision and inspiration. So the more in contact we are with the light and the love and the power of the cosmic heart that we are, the more of a visionary we are. To be a visionary means that we're not carrying the the news of the media today as a sense of direction for the day. It means that as a visionary, we're carrying the future wherever we go. We're lighting up, we're illuminating others' heart with inspiration, with hope, with a sense of future. 
and thus love and light eradicates darkness. We're not fighting darkness with darkness. We're not fighting hatred with hatred. See? When we talk about those who have strong hearts, we are talking about people whose heart centers are vital and nourished by the cosmic heart. There are no clogged arteries in a strong heart, of course that's a metaphor, there are, but maybe not. So there are no clogged arteries in a strong heart. I mean, that's obvious, that makes sense, right? But we're talking spiritually here. Clogged arteries are eight things. Hatred, greed, fear, dishonesty, jealousy, revenge, slander, and treason. Right now, the higher nature of the heart of humanity is clogged. This tells us that the disciples of their world need to work a little bit harder. Too many of our families and churches today have clogged arteries. Too many relationships have become damaged because of these eight monstrous vipers. Particularly jealousy. I've always believed that jealousy is a vice that grows with us. We carry it with us from one life to another, to another, to another, and it builds upon itself. So as we go through one particular incarnation and we have a moment of jealousy, if we don't have the wisdom to eradicate that moment, then we carry it with us into our next life. And then it becomes an attraction and we draw another moment of jealousy and maybe several moments of jealousy and we take that with us into our next life. Okay? And this is why so many people are born as jealous human beings. It's very interesting to think about. Anyway, that's what I believe. So, for example, if we find the worm of jealousy in our hearts, we will find that we have a weakened heart nature. If we have hatred in our hearts, we will find that we have a weak heart, and so forth. These eight monsters are the enemies to our heart. Our physical organism, our astral and mental hearts, and our spiritual heart. So let me state these out again. It's hatred, greed, fear, dishonesty, jealousy, revenge, slander, and treason. When these enemies daily attack our heart and our arteries become clogged, what happens? Because something does happen. And we, we need to recognize it from an individual level to a national to a global level. We are cutting ourselves off from the radiation of the one life, the cosmic heart. So what, what does this mean to us? This means we are cut from the teachings of the great ones. When we're cut from the teaching of the great ones, we are repelled by the teaching. We are repelled by those who carry that beacon of fire, that beacon of light, that beacon of love. We become repulsed by them because there's no magnetic attraction. So when these eight vipers, monstrous vipers, you know, have um, buried themselves uh, into our consciousness, then we become cut off from the radiation of the one life or the cosmic heart. And repeating this in part, this means we are cut from the teaching of the Great Ones, from the beauty of Christ, the beauty of Buddha and other messengers 
of the heart. It means that we're rejecting their teaching. We're rejecting the teaching by becoming hypocrites. Or we mask ourselves in the words of their teachings. And I've seen this also, and I'm sure you have too, that, that we listen to somebody, they have a nomenclature similar to ours, and we think they're one of us. You know, these are people of light and love and beauty and goodness and service and freedom. And yet pretty soon we discover, wait a minute, they're not practicing. They're not practitioners of the teaching. They've masked themselves with these words, but they go, their actions go against the, what the Great Ones gave to us. The Great Ones need strong hearts to carry their message, to carry their message into humanity, to heal the heart of humanity, to heal the heart of the family, the group, the nation, the world. So to be a healer, you must have a strong heart. Those who have strong hearts are those whose heart center is what? open. <laughs> Their heart center must be open. When the heart center in the head is awake, it is then we can transmit the life electricity of the great cosmic heart. Now, you know, this is just a, a concept, an idea that hopefully, or seed thought, let's say, will hopefully take you into the teaching into the writings, into the uh, books of the teaching, so that you can think about what does it mean, the heart center in the head? Because every center that we have, these major centers like the heart center, like the head center, like the throat center, all have centers in the head, correspondence in the head. So. Once, like last Sunday, I talked about purifying our heart. As we engage in the process of purifying our heart, then the heart center in the head begins to awaken. And when it awakens, it becomes a receptor. And it becomes a receptor to the life electricity, the radiation of the great cosmic heart. So it is not just, you know, what I'm sharing this morning is not simply words on a piece of paper or a hypothesis. Once you have this experience, it is a reality. And this is what the great ones are trying to tell us. Let it become your reality. How can you recognize people who have strong hearts, plain and simple through one word. They are unifiers. People who have strong hearts are unifiers. They are the protectors of the family, the group, the nation, and of humanity. So if you are one of those people, you know that you have a very difficult life. You're living a difficult life because you're going against the stream of a humanity who is not yet functioning in its higher heart. That means chances are someone in your family or some ones in your family fall under the umbrella of those eight monstrous vipers. And your job now is to protect them from themselves. So how do we do this? We're carrying this torch of light and love and freedom and gratitude and harmlessness and so forth into the family. And what are they going to do? They're going to be repulsed. To be repulsed means that they're going to act like your enemy but you have a strong heart. 
You stand steady. You cannot be a reactor, but a responder. So those who have strong hearts are recognized as being a unifier, and then they have refinement, tenderness, love. Refinement, tenderness, love. Gratitude, solemnity. They practice harmlessness and they are compassionate. Master M explained that the solar plexus is the antechamber of the heart. Well, what the heck does that mean? You know? <laughs> well, he tells us. The solar plexus is the lower heart. It's the lower heart. The lower heart is related to all negative emotions. The lower heart then must be purified by the higher heart. And this is the way the whole process of the teaching tells us. Uh, the higher comes in and regenerates and purifies and cleanses the lower. So how are we going to do that? These great ones come into our lives through the teaching. Sometimes an actual messenger of hierarchy comes to the planet, sometimes, you know, for a few moments and makes a profound impact and then leaves. Other times they sacrifice themselves by coming into a physical body and, and they write lots of books and they put themselves in the line of fire and are usually crucified in some way. But then we revere them and we adore them and we devote ourselves to them, even though we killed them off. <laughs> We're such a strange society, you know, strange humanity. Uh, love, hate, love, hate, love, hate, or hate, love, hate, love, so forth. So the lower heart must be purified by the higher heart, and it is usually the messengers of hierarchy, the messengers of the cosmic heart that come in and activate for a period of time our higher heart. It's like they loan us the radiation of their higher heart. And slowly, little by little, little by little, it activates and it cleanses out our solar plexus. The higher heart is the chalice. It is the contact point of the cosmic heart. But this is directly from the Agni teaching, that the higher heart is the chalice, the contact point of the cosmic heart, and it's also the source of all virtues. So a person who wants to have a strong heart must purify the antechamber, the lower heart. When you think about some of our great, great, beautiful teachers that sacrificed themselves by incarnating into a physical body and how they die of cancer or they die of a heart attack, it's because they have given themselves to us. And in return, they absorb the, all of this negativity. We read about the story of Helena Rourke, how someone, a close friend or a student or a, even a country is in trouble and they need healing and she would absorb. She'd sacrifice herself and absorb what needed to be healed. It's very interesting to think about. So a person who wants to have a strong heart must purify the antechamber, the lower heart. To purify the antechamber of the heart is the way for us to fuse with the higher heart or the chalice. When we fuse the lower heart with the higher heart, we're going to turn into a source of tenderness. See, this, isn't a, this is not a word that we read on the front page of the New York Times. Or... CNN, but they're coming close to it. I don't know who it was that was talking this morning when I was listening to uh, Sirius Radio, but 
it was pretty exciting. So as we begin to function with the energy, the electricity of the higher heart, we're going to turn into a source of tenderness and fondness and sensitivity. Now, despite all the nurturing resources the heart has access to, nonetheless, there are some people in the world who fall into the category of heartlessness. Heartless people are repelled by the teaching. What happens with heartless people? So this is a science, you know, this is not a fabrication, this is a science. How does a person become heartless? Their actions of thought and mind and deed work against unity and love. This is how you can tell a person is heartless. You can tell a person is heartless by their lack of sensitivity by their lack of fondness, by their lack of tenderness. Their actions of thought, mind, and deed work against unity and love. We, the teaching tells us we must stay away from heartless people. And why is this? See, it's the good people that are going to go into the darkness I'm going to save them. And pretty soon, we're the ones that need to be saved. So unless we are a Christ, unless we are a master, unless we are a great one that is ready to sacrifice this life for others, then we are told we must stay away from heartless people. For in time, their nature can poison our heart. In the Agni Yoga teachings, such heartless people are sometimes recognized as worms. For example, Agni Yoga, Agni Yoga uses this term in many ways. But in this specific instance, describes such a one who covertly or subtly tries to undermine a marriage. This is a worm subtly tries to undermine a marriage. How do they do that? They present themselves as being someone that that individual in the, of the marriage couple will begin to lust for because of their behavior. It's very interesting, and that's the worm. And we don't see it. We don't catch it. Or they will separate the couple the worm comes in and separates the couple and says, you know, I noticed your husband looking at another woman kind of fondly, planting this seed of doubt in the wife, saying, uh-oh, my husband doesn't love me anymore. See that? That's the worm. So this is why in our marriage ceremonies we talk about the importance of protecting your marriage. A worm can come into a family and divide the family. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a period of time, sometimes years. This can happen to a group. It can happen to a government. The master says the worm is concealed by a smile and politeness. See, smile and politeness, so we think they're one of us. But they're a worm, so we have to be careful. And let me repeat this. The master says this worm is concealed by a smile and politeness. He ceaselessly tunnels through the aura and harms or undermines all works through so many ways, but planting the seed of doubt is one. A person who has not yet purified their heart and functions within a group must be observed very carefully. 
for this is a very dangerous type of person. The worm type, again, this is from Agni Yoga, the worm type is one of egoism or conceit. Thus, out of an insignificant worm grows a most frightful dragon. When, when I first, you know, I have a very dear friend that has a uh, signature in their email. Every time they send out an email, the signature comes up about the worm, and it's always driven me crazy. What does he mean about, you know, this worm? We don't let worms into our home, into the battlefield. So finally I went to, he's an Agni Yoga student, and so I finally went into Agni Yoga and did a compilation on worm. Now I get it. And I became so excited because it's so descriptive of events that happen into our life and we don't see that little worm that's burrowing its way, you know, through the aura and life and all that we are trying to do to get ahead. So it becomes, as an insignificant worm, it grows and becomes a frightful dragon. But we have dragon slayers, so. <laughs> the qualities of the heart are sensitivity, selflessness, gracefulness, and tenderness as well as harmlessness, gratitude, compassion. Ah, oh, gratitude, I wrote it down twice. It must be something important. <laughs> Strong hearts have, a, have the power of God within them. We are told if the power of God is within us, then the flame of our heart will be red or red-orange. Okay, now in the, the time I have left, I have a list that I've collected from the teaching uh, that are signs of the strong heart. So we'll see how, I think I can get through them all. So the first one, and there are nine of them. The first one is, if you have a strong heart, this sign is that you are decisive and that you have perseverance decisive and perseverance. Decisive means when we decide to do something, we do so without faltering. The second is striving. I talked about striving last week. Such a person strives, one with a strong heart strives. They strive to conquer their limitations and their hindrances, and they forge ahead on the path of the heart. So striving is an inner effort, inner effort, to make our life better and more useful. The third point is nobility. One with a strong heart demonstrates nobility. So nobility, this is an interesting interpretation of nobility. Uh, the teaching says that nobility is a state of being a light. It is a state of being a light. So for example, are we really noble in our thoughts, in our relationships, in our reactions and responses? If we insult someone or they insult us, one with a strong heart will not be affected. It will not destroy us. We will remain noble, that late, that light will not uh, flicker. I just had a flickering lamp light this past week. Oh, is this a sign? <laughs> <laughs> I know, you can't help it. You know, you become an esotericist and everything means something, you know. And so here's this light flickering and I thought, oh, this is, what's going on here? Finally I asked Joe, can you change the light bulb? <laughs> he changed the light bulb and it stopped flickering. Oh, great. So the sign was the light bulb needed to be changed. Anyway, 
Sometimes we think about those people, they are insulting me and I'm gonna crush them. Instead, we're supposed to show our beauty. Just radiate beauty and we may conquer them. It is with the power of our beauty that we will knock them down. See, not with the baseball bat. <laughs> Honesty is a fourth. Honesty means not to cheat people, not to lie to people. This is a big one. Holy criminy, not to lie to people. <laughs> people are so used to being lied to that unconsciously they begin to reflect liars by lying themselves. So the, to the point that they don't even know they're lying. It's just a convenient statement because it protects them in some way or another. Honesty means not to deceive others. Don't be sneaky. We live in a society as start, that's starting to believe that lying is okay. Okay, so we may get away with it, but lies deceive the heart the flame of the heart. So try hard not to lie, but if you do, then try to stop yourself. Think, what are you doing? What is this going to gain you? So just shut up. <laughs> Walk away from the lie. Stop yourself. Because if you lie, you will have to pay taxes for that lie. There is a married doctor who is having an affair <laughs> with four other women. I can't even imagine. That must have been a very busy doctor. <laughs> he, said, he told this teacher, he said he was really enjoying his life. The teacher asked him, well, what kind of enjoyment is that? You are not being honest with your wife, are you? He admitted, no. He said, no, I'm not being honest with my wife. The teacher said, if you are not being honest, then you are not on the right path. No matter how much enjoyment you are having, whether you are a doctor, a philosopher, or a minister, it is possible to deceive others, but it is impossible to deceive the flame in your heart. Number five, concentration. This is interesting. When the red flame of our heart is lit, this is when we are focused and we are concentrated on our goal. This is what concentration means. We're concentrated on our goal, our life, our purpose, our promises, and our decisions. If we promise something and then two days later break it without a serious reason, then we lack concentration. If you begin a project and then quit before it is complete, you lack concentration. So concentration is a steady, progressive use of energy to reach a particular goal. And those who have a strong heart have concentration. The six is action. You will be a person of action if you have a strong heart. This is such an interesting quality for one who has a strong heart. If the flame of their heart is really ignited, they are going to take wise action. Wise action. It means a person who is wise, loving, and beautiful in all his actions. That's what action means for one with a strong heart. But the motive and the purpose behind the action must be right. If you see a person is dying, this is pretty dramatic, but I have seen it. If you see a person is dying and you do not take action, then you are the one who is dead. For example, a wife sees her husband is not feeling well and may be in trouble, he may be in trouble, but the wife does nothing about it. This is a wife who is heartless. People who stand back and watch their children take drugs 
or let their son or daughter sleep with multiple partners without taking action, do not have a flame in their heart. Without a flame, you are dead. See, there's no connection with the cosmic heart. Number seven, the power to unite. There is a sickness going on today, which is the sickness of separ separatism. It exists everywhere. A person with a strong heart always uses words to unite, to bring families together, to bring couples back together, to bring children and groups and nations and families and countries together. The power to unite. The Agni Yogi is a person who always works to unite to bring together families, couples, children, groups, nations. So separatism is a sickness which cannot be tolerated. Number eight is the power to renounce and to sacrifice. And number nine is joyfulness. Joyfulness is one of the greatest qualities we can have. It is from the soul. See, it's not pretending to be happy or put that smile on the face. It is from the soul. It is the light of the flame. So many people come home from work and they drop all of the problems on their family. That's not joyful. So after a hard day at the office, some come through the door and talk about such destructive things, how the world is falling into an abyss. Yeah, I know. I watch CNN all the time. I know. I know we're on the brink. <laughs> or how a country was destroyed. Well, these things are happening. But why bring it in after your spouse or your family has not seen you all day and you come in while we at lunch, we were all talking about this and that and the... What is the statement that you see? Life is going to hell in a handbasket. Hand <laughs> I remember, where does that come from? So instead, open that door and say, hello, let me hug everybody. I am so glad to be with you after a long work day. What a difference. It is hard to say exactly how many people on earth currently have the flame of the heart active in their hearts. It cannot be too great of a percentage or we would not have the kinds of political and economic and religious crises that happen today or exist today. Just as the flame of a candle increases at the expense of the candle, selfishness, self-interest, egotism, vanity, and possessiveness must decrease and vanity so that only the pure heart remains. You can see this flame in another's eyes, literally, when the flame of the heart is present. Without the flame, obsession and possession starts in your nature. Your friendships end. Your prosperity vanishes from your business and you continually fail. You know, that these are tough words and we don't want to confront them. Our personality doesn't for a while until something happens. I, oh, I don't understand this, but I need to take a look. The hearts, let me wrap up with this. This is a quote. The heart stands as the temple of humanity. The heart stands as the temple of humanity. And that's from verse 339 in the book Heart. So let us strive to build this temple within ourselves and within humanity. Build this temple with strong hearts. So, so we have something to work on that will be significant in a worldwide level.